And for more on NASA's mission, I'm joined by John Horak from Ohio State University. He's the Associate Director of Policy and Strategy at the Center for Aviation Studies. John, as we wait for that launch to get underway, let's first talk about something mentioned in that piece we just saw, that there wasn't the technology before to do this. So what kind of technology exactly is needed for a probe like this? So we need all kinds of technology. First of all, you need a very large launch vehicle, which is why it's on a Delta IV Heavy. Uh, you also need extremely good materials, uh, you know, we machining silicon carbide and other exotic materials that can withstand the heat. This probe is going to be some 20 times closer to the sun than the Earth, which means the sun will be almost 400 times more intense uh, than it is here at the Earth. So you have to build a very, very robust spacecraft that can withstand that kind of environment. And John, also in that piece, it mentions this a concept called solar wind yep. and how it can interfere with life here on Earth. Can you give us some specific examples? Yeah, so this is really a mission that's not unlike uh, the ancient explorers who would want to find the headwaters of a river that they had discovered. Well, this river that we have, it's actually three-dimensional uh, coming off the sun, particles coming off at a million miles an hour. This is a voyage to try to find the headwaters of the solar wind. And the solar wind creates all kinds of interesting things. We heard in the piece just before this about ionospheric disturbances, for example. When you use GPS to find your place or land an airplane, one of the major corrections that has to be made in that signal is a correction for the Earth's ionosphere. So it has really, really uh, down-to-earth impacts on our day-to-day -day life as simple things like driving around town or landing an airplane. Mm. And how might results from the probe of when it goes off help us er on Earth here in the future? How do you think that might be? Well, as we grow and our dependency on things like satellite navigation, the satellite communication that you and I are using right now, our understanding of what might happen in the future, the difference between Mars and Earth, for example, all of this is tied up in the sun because the sun is the primary provider of energy for everything we have here on Earth. And so by understanding the solar wind, that's the main mechanism between how the sun and the Earth interact, we stand to learn a lot about how things work and how we can make ourselves more resilient uh, to, to detrimental effects that could come from space weather. And John, the spacecraft is expected to come within about six million kilometers of the sun's surface. To the layman, that still sounds very far away, but it's actually not, right? For example, how far away from the sun here on Earth? Yeah, we're, we're about 93 million miles away from the sun, uh, and this spacecraft is going to go within 6 million miles of the sun. So, you know, like I said, it's almost a factor of, you know, 20 or so is a good round number. Uh, and it will spiral in closer and closer on those 24 orbits. That's the closest it will get. Uh, so it's really, really going to dive deep into the belly of the beast to try to figure out where this solar wind is coming from. All right, John Horak of Ohio State University, thanks so much for your perspective. Hey, thank you very much for having me.